cover the kinematic section of the physics syllabus. Firstly, the most fundamental thing that you need to know for this section is the difference between speed, velocity, and acceleration. Speed is the rate at which distance is covered. When you look at speed, you look at the total amount of ground that an object has covered, which we call distance. Speed is calculated as your distance divided by the time, the time of the period that you're looking at. Um, speed is a scalar quantity, so it does not have direction, and it is measured in meters per second. With every answer that you give where you're asked for speed, you must include the unit, which is meters per second. In some instances, you may be asked for instantaneous speed, which is the speed of an object at a particular instant, which is normally easiest to find from a motion graph. Secondly, your velocity is your rate of change of displacement. Now, velocity is very different to your speed. Velocity, as you can see, takes into account your displacement. Displacement is not the total ground that an object covers. Displacement is only the distance between your starting point and your ending point. Um, velocity is a vector quantity, so it takes into account your direction of travel. And it is calculated as your displacement over your time for the period. Velocity is also measured in meters per second. However, in questions where you're asked for velocity, you must include your unit meters per second, as well as the direction of the movement. Then thirdly, you've got acceleration, which is your rate of change of velocity. So this indicates how quickly your velocity of the object is changing. Acceleration is calculated taking your final velocity, represented by V, minus your initial velocity, represented by U, over the time for the period that you're looking at. Uh, acceleration is also a vector quantity and it must take into account your direction of travel. So when giving an answer to acceleration, you must include your units, which are meters per second squared, as shown here, and you must include your direction of travel. In many instances, your acceleration, velocity, and speed will be tested with a ticker timer, which will be shown on a ticker tape. When given your time, you must know that your frequency will be one over your time. And when given frequency, you must know that your time is one over your frequency. Then it's important to know how to change from kilometers per hour to meters per second. To go from kilometers per hour to meters per second, you're going to divide by 3.6. And to go the other way around from meters per second to kilometers per hour, you're going to go times 3.6. Then motion graphs are also very important in this section. It's important to know that with a displacement graph, your slope of the graph will give you the velocity of the object. With a velocity time graph, the slope of the graph will give you the acceleration of the object and the area below the graph will give you the displacement of the object up to that point. With an acceleration graph, the area below the graph will give you the change in velocity. So the change from the beginning point to the end point, the change in velocity for that period of the object. Then we move on to the equations of motion, which form a large section of this section of the syllabus. There are three main equations of motion. They can be written in many forms. This is how they are written on the formula sheet for IAB matric exams. So first you have V equals U plus AT. Then you have V squared equals U squared plus 2AS and S equals UT plus half AT squared. V is your final velocity in meters per second. U is your initial velocity in meters per second. A is your acceleration in meters per second squared, time in seconds, and S is your displacement in meters. You must remember when using these equations to always have your final and initial velocity in meters per second 
So if they give it to you in kilometers per hour, you must use the conversion that we've just spoken about to get it into meters per second. And you must always remember your time is in seconds and your displacement is in meters. When using your equations of motion, you must remember to choose positive and negative directions. So if you have, for instance, a car moving north, you must define north as either positive or negative, And from there, you must work with your directions, which we will see later on. Just some things to note that are important and will help you with this section. When velocity and acceleration are in the same direction, the object will speed up. So if you have a car moving north and you accelerate, you your acceleration will be north, your car will speed up. Whereas if you have a car moving north and you now apply the brakes, your acceleration, your force will be south, your car will slow down. Which is velocity and acceleration on opposite direction, the object will slow down. Objects starting at rest, your u will always be zero meters per second. Object that comes to rest, v will always be zero meters per second. An object dropped, which is not moving, your initial velocity, which is u, will always be zero meters per second. Whereas an object dropped from a moving vehicle, say a car or a hot air balloon or an airplane, your u will always be the velocity of the moving vehicle. And then just good to remember that time is always scalar and it can never be negative. So if you get a quadratic equation from one of your equations of motion, you know that you can discard the negative answer. Then varied motion in this section can be quite complicated. For varied motion, you must always break it down into sections of uniform acceleration. So let's look at this example, which shows the section quite nicely. So a car is accelerated from rest at six meters per second until it reaches a speed of 36 kilometers per hour, at which point the driver changes into second gear. Acceleration is then continued at four meters per second until the car is traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. What is the total distance covered by the car? So as you can see, we break it into a first part and a second part. So for the first part, you're using your initial is zero. It accelerated from rest. Your V is 10 meters per second. We've uh, converted the 36 kilometers per hour divided by 3.6 to uh, get 10 meters per second. And your acceleration is six meters per second squared. We use our equation of motion as shown on the right to get our distance to be 8.3 meters. In the same way, for the second part, we do the same thing using an acceleration of four meters per second because we've broken into acceleration of six meters per second. And then the second part is our second acceleration of four meters per second. And we get a distance of 22.4, add them together, and you've got your total distance. So it's good to remember that you must always break it down into sections of uniform acceleration. Then vertical motion and free fall. Projectiles fall freely with gravitational acceleration, which is G, which we know to be 9.8 meters per second. Acceleration of an object is always downward. They often try and trick you by saying you throw a ball upwards, which in which direction is the acceleration. Acceleration will always be 9.8 meters per second downward, no matter what the object is and no matter the size or weight of the object. Also, they try and confuse you often when they say, for instance, we throw a ball up at the highest point of the throw where the ball hits the highest point. What is the velocity? The velocity will be zero because the ball at that instant is not moving. However, your acceleration at that point will still be 9.8 meters per second downwards. Then it's good to know that your object takes the same amount of time to reach the top as it takes to come back down. That's if you're throwing something up and it falls back down and displacement will be zero at your initial point of throwing the object. So let's look at this example just to see how we work these kinds of questions. So a ball is thrown upwards at 17 meters per second from a height of 1.5 meters above the ground. 
it hits the ground sometime later. Calculate the velocity as it strikes the ground. The weight is constant from the start to finishing point and therefore the problem can be viewed as one motion from start to end. So if up is defined as positive, we look at the throw going this way. Your U is 17 meters per second positive because you've defined up as positive. You, you're calculating your V. Your acceleration is negative 10. They've used negative 10, but can use negative 9.8. Remember, it's negative because your acceleration is down and your displacement is negative 1.5 meters because your initial starting point is X1. Downwards, it will hit the ground, which is negative 1.5 meters. Now, to solve for your V, you're going to use V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Sub in all your values and you will get a plus minus. Now, we know that our, our final velocity is downwards. So, we know to take the negative because we've defined up as positive and down as negative. So, therefore, it's negative 17.9 meters per second. And you must put the down um, to show that you've interpreted the direction because it's a vector, you must include your direction. In the same way, if you define um, down as positive, you do the exact same working, except your, your initial velocity is now up, so it'll be negative, and your displacement will be positive because down is positive now, and your acceleration is positive because it's negative. It, sorry, it's positive. 10 meters per second downwards and you define down as positive you get the same answer with a positive answer uh, a positive sign on the 17.9 and that's right because you've defined down as positive showing that 17.9 meters per second down then the last section that you need to cover for this kinematic section is terminal velocity terminal velocity is the maximum velocity attained by an object which has a constant applied force acting on it while moving through a frictional medium. So if an object is falling, initially there's 700 newtons downwards. This is an example. Before you reach terminal velocity, there's 700 newtons acting downwards and there's 400 newtons acting upwards, which will be your friction um, as the object travels through the frictional medium. As you reach terminal velocity, your upward force caused by a frictional medium is equal to the downward force. This is the point where you will reach your maximum velocity. So that, that is how you would calculate your terminal velocity. It's not asked very often, but it is good to know how it works and understand terminal velocity and know that it's the maximum velocity of an object traveling through a frictional medium.